Extraordinary scene at Brighton. The Brighton old chain pier has gone. No American speculator will be able to convey its chains and timbers across the Atlantic. There is no possibility even of erecting the old friend of so many Brightonians across the level or across Queen's Park, as correspondents have suggested. The chain pier cannot now be said to be on sale. The corporation will not again have the offer of it or again be able to decline to accept it as a gift. All questions as to its future were settled by the heavy south-southeast gale of last night and its fragments may be looked for today anywhere along the south coast. When the evening closed in yesterday, the old pier was standing, much as it had done for the last few months, its ancient glory of paint and polish considerably faded, and a distinct aspect of dilapidation about its head and its two seaward clump of piles, which appeared to have derived a considerable tilt from the violence of southwestern gales, and looked as if another good shove on that side would settle its business once and for all. As it happened, the attack came from the other side, but it was just as effective. After bearing the shock of wind and waves heroically for some time, as it had been doing during the last seventy years and more, the famous structure collapsed like a pack of cards. And at eleven o'clock, where it had stood, there was only to be seen a wild waste of foamy water, out of which loomed indistinctly the first clump of piles, perhaps only a portion of them, looking more like the black and shattered ribs of some ancient wreck. From these piles to the shore there dangled two lengths of the suspension chain, but except for these chains there was nothing but a yawning chasm where previously there had been the deck, and beyond nothing but waves rolling in as far as one could see. The deck of the pier, the two outer clumps of piles with their towers, the vista-like appearance of which, seen from Marine Parade, our fathers so much admired, the head of the pier, the irregular piles of which made so much for the picturesqueness of the whole, these things had all totally disappeared. Long even before the startling event of last night happened, hundreds of people had been attracted to the King's Road and Marine Parade by the mere wildness of the night. The storm was of a character seldom experienced at Brighton. The wind was from the southeast, a quarter commonly fraught with disaster on this part of the coast, though southwestern gales frequently blow over without doing much damage. The sea was of the roughest, immense waves breaking at certain well-known points over the projecting wall of the Madeira Road between Junction Road and the Aquarium, and sending showers of spray clear over the Aquarium in one place and in another upon the roofs of the buildings next to Snelling's Bazaar. Madeira Road was soon flooded with water, and as the tide rose, showers of stones began to rattle on the pavement. At half-past ten, when it still wanted some half-hour to high tide, the disaster occurred. The two outer clumps of piles first disappeared, their wreck being a matter of an instant, and before the few spectators of the affair had recovered from their surprise, the head of the pier also had gone. With the destruction of these supports, the huge chains stretching from the face of the cliff to the last tower must have snapped, possibly in several places, and with the wrench given by the fall of other portions of the structure, the deck spanning the gap between the shore and the first piles disappeared with its supporting chains, and nothing was left beyond the toll gates on the beach and the first mass of piles. These piles stand on a firmer foundation than those beyond, and were indeed at one time out of the water at ordinary high tides, and it was the general opinion of spectators, after the crash had taken place, that they would be able to stand whatever of wind and waves had yet to be experienced, and be seen today, the last remaining seaward portion of the old chain pier. Following this disaster, remarkable scenes were witnessed along the front from the site of the pier westward. The wreckage was at once carried in by the combined influence of wind and current, and added enormously to the destructive power of the waves in the immediate vicinity. The real extent of the damage done will only be seen this morning, but it must have been very great. Much of the deck and the light woodwork of the pier was evidently smashed almost to matchwood when the collapse took place, but hundreds of huge timbers, including, no doubt, the main piles upon which the structure rested, were tossed about like straws on the waves, and it may be imagined that a mass of wood weighing many hundredweight and dashed again and again upon anything that happened to be in its way would constitute about as formidable a battering ram as could be imagined. Whether from this cause, or the unaided effect of the waves, extraordinary damage was done. 
For a large space on each side of the pier, the electric railway was completely wiped out. The railway, as everyone knows, makes a sort of dip under the pier, having on the outside the protection of a wooden fence. This fence was shattered at once and the rails displaced. Further on, a few yards to the east of the pier, the waves, and here probably the floating timbers had nothing to do with the matter, made a great gap in the bank, taking a piece out of the Madeira Road very much as the fall of the cliff at Black Rock took a piece out of the Rottingdean Road some years ago. Here again, the electric railway was completely destroyed, and the temporary wooden retaining wall removed in great part, this little gap presenting a remarkable scene of destruction. Further westward again, the electric railway was destroyed, and the trestles on which it was carried high above the beach washed away, at a spot where it has often experienced damage in storms. At high tide, wreckage was tossed through or over the railings near the aquarium, and shattered timber was piled up on the road by the mere action of the waves, as though for the foundations of a series of bonfires. Some slight damage was done to the railings, and one or two seats were overturned. The wooden groin between the pier and the aquarium was much shattered, but still stood, though large holes had been knocked in it in places, and at this point the railings were broken, probably by the impact of some massive piece of wreckage. The structure of the Marine Palace and Pier Company naturally attracted some interest, it being thought by many that its iron piles would be unable to endure the buffeting they were sure to meet with from pieces of floating wood. As far as could be seen, however, the pier was safe. At all events, the white light at the end was shining out in the gale as steadily as ever. Just on the west side, however, there was a remarkable sight, hundreds of timbers having lodged, as it were, on the east side of the aquarium groin, where, while the tide was still high, they were tossed up like semi-solid mass, or rolled over another in a singular manner. Many huge fragments pitched onto the groin itself. Further west still, the beach was strewn with pieces of wood, and though hasty measures were taken by many of the boatmen, and some boats even drawn up onto the upper esplanade, much damage must have been caused to bathing machines and to craft of various kinds. As the tide went down, much of the wood was drawn up on the beach by fishermen, and though some of the smaller pieces were carried away by spectators as mementos of the disaster, there will be timber enough left to keep many fires.